Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. I am Alexandre Porte. I am a postdoc here in CFT. And today we are going to talk about the foundations of quantum mechanics and also quantum information, a bit of quantum metrology. But essentially, we are going to uh, address the measurement problem. So first of all, I would like to thank my collaborators, without whom this uh, work would not be possible. First, I have my previous PhD advisor, Professor Renato Angelo, back there in the University of uh, Federal University of Paraná in Curitiba, Brazil. I also have my colleague Pedro. Pedro Diegues is in Getans, working with uh, Martin Pavlovsky. And also, of course, my prestigious uh, fellows, Ovidio Shmakuta and Remigio Shalkushak here in, in CFT. So uh, first, in my presentation, I will talk about uh, quantum realism and elements of physical reality, which is a work that I did with Professor Renato. And after that, I will go to uh, one of the results that I have here with this colleagues. Okay, so first we have to uh, make a question. How do quantum things become classical? How I take something that is in superposition and I obtain a definite outcome. Okay, most of the people will just say, oh, this is just coherence, uh, decoherence. Yeah, but decoherence does not explain everything. For instance, uh, does not explain the measurement problem in, uh, per se. Why do we see one output instead of its alternatives? Why do you measure something and you get, for instance, uh, is been up instead of it's been down. What, what is happening? Some people would say, okay, it's just uh, that quantum mechanics is uh, random, is intrinsically random. Well, but I cannot go to bed after that in, in, in the sleep side because just saying that quantum mechanics is intrinsically random is not an effort. Uh, what is a measurement? And But what is a measurement I am asking? When the measurement ends in the Stern Gallet apparatus, for instance, you send your spin one half particle to the measurement, the spin interacts with the, the magnetic field, you have some entanglement between those two degrees of freedom, and then uh, the, the, the trajectory of the particle is deviated, and after that, you see some mark on the wall. That's great, you have a measurement. But when does the measurement end? Is before hitting the wall, is right after here when the two trajectories can be distinguished? It, do you need a person to be there in the laboratory? Does this person need to have a PhD? We don't know, actually. Um, another question that we can do about the quantum measurement uh, problem is is the output created during the measurement or is it just a revelation of some predefined quantity so the measurement result that we see all the time is defined yes but is it just a revelation of something that was already there that the particle had this has been already defined before and we just reveal it just like tossing a coin game, the coin blend on the back of your hand, you cover it and it is already defined. When you raise the hand, you reveal the, the, the measurement result. It is like that or not. Well, we will see that sometimes you have this behavior, sometimes not. One of the ways to address this problem is uh, going back to the einstein podolsky rosen EPR problem. In that time, 1935, they said, not with these words, I just <clears throat> choose it a small, a small phrase, a physical property is real if we can predict its result with certainty without interference. Actually, the phrase is longer, but I shot it. So if you can predict the result with certainty without interfering with it, then you can say, okay, that there, there is an element of physical reality related to that quantity. Okay, so with that, we can say that measurement establish reality because after you measure something, after you measure, for instance, the spin of the electron 
and you discover, okay, is it Spain now? If you measure it again, you will obtain the same result, right? In the same direction, of course. So that means that that quantity was already predefined before the measurement. You can say that there is an element of physical reality associated to that quantity because you can predict the result without measuring it. Okay, however, what about mixed states? Because the EPR paper does not talk about mixed states. For instance, if you take the most mixed state ever, the, the maximally mixed state, an identity, is there anything quantum inside this, this, this state? No, there isn't. You cannot do superposition with it. You cannot do entanglement with it. But you can also you cannot also predict its results. So could you say that there is an element of physical reality associated to this state? Well, if you uh, use, for instance, the analogy with the coin tossing game, when the coin uh, lands on the back of your hand and you cover it, the result is already defined. The act of raising your hand will not change it, okay? So when you raise the hand, you just reveal the outcome, but it is already defined. So we should have some kind of uh, definition of physical reality that takes into account mixed states like this not just the, 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 the pure states in the EPR problem. So, sorry, what I want to ask, what is without interference? If you measure the mm -hmm. speed, and if it's without interference, then second time, you cannot, you shouldn't measure next second time, but it's already destroyed. But what is without interference? That means I measure, mm -hmm. but I don't change anything. But after I measure it, like on your screen, uh -huh. after that, if you if you measure again the spin in the same direction of an electron, you will have the Different same result. I mean, in, in ah, okay, yes, yes. I have to measure it many times mm -hmm. without interference. The result will be same. In this case, uh, you have a source that gives you infinitely many copies of a state. For instance, an oven that, uh, with silver inside, you open a hole, the particles start to get out. No, I understand, but in, in statistical mechanics, it's the same, but you cannot predict the result. Well. well, for the second measurement, of course, the first measurement usually destroys things. But for the second measurement, it appears that it doesn't destroy anything because the state is already destroyed. So the second verification measurement, for the purpose of the second verification measurement, the system behaves like if you were revealing a predefined property because you get it with certainty and you don't, don't destroy the state because of course it was already destroyed by the first measurement. I guess that's the logic. Yeah, thank you for Thank you for a question. Okay, uh, so a way to, 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 to use this kind of, of, of definition was presented uh, as the reality of observables. So suppose that we have an observable written in this form, a very nice observable with projectors uh, orthogonal to each other. And with that, we say that an observable A is real for the state rho if and only if the action of a non-selective projective measurement is innocuous to the state. So a, a way of, of describing the, this phrase is through this procedure. So imagine that you have a source that gives you infinitely many copies of the state. You can send it and obtain a tomography uh, to, to, to obtain the, the statistical description of the state. Okay, now imagine that in the middle, a secret agent measures always the same observable and keeps the, the, the result secret. Okay, now what you have, the best statistical way to describe this state is through this, this, this map, which is the map of non-selective projective measurement. This state is bipartite, okay? And I am measuring just one part of it. Now, if you compare these two density matrices, if they are equal, 
we say that the observable A is real for that preparation. It's a definition. Okay, let's see some examples. Take, for instance, the state uh, given by the maximally mixed, uh, the maximally entangled state of two qubits, phi plus. Okay, and the observable in question here is the sigma z. The sigma z, the, in the same computational basis. If I act this map of non selective measurement over the state, what I get is this is different from the original state. So that, so after that, we can say, yes, sigma z is not real for this particle. And here, sigma z is for the first particle, not the second one. Okay. But if you do the, the, the math for the second part, it's going to be the same because this state is completely symmetric. Okay. Now, what happens if I take a separable state like this, zero, zero? What happens? Well, if you measure the sigma z and you kept the, the result in secret, then nothing happens. That means that sigma z is real for that state. Now, if I take, for instance, the maximally mixed state, and that is the difference from one of the difference from the, the, the EPR argument. Well, now if you take the mixed state, you don't know the result. Yes, of course, because it's a maximally mixed state, but you can say, yes, there is already a reality associated to that quantity because the action of this map does not change the state. So we say, yes, yeah, sigma, sigma Z is real for that state. Yes? So this property of being real or not like depends on whether the state is entangled or not. Because so like if you have an entangled state, mm -hmm. there's no observable for it that, that would be real for it. It is not just entanglement. Mm -hmm. There is coherence too. Ah, uh, yes. Okay, there is this disco. No, it must be disco zero. Yes. yes. <clears throat> Well, uh, instead of just saying, okay, it's real, it's not, we can quantify. We can quantify how much uh, this state uh, will change or not by this uh, map. They call that a reality measure. And this reality measure is just the entropic difference between the state and the measured state. I know that the name is a bit provocative and fancy, but if you attend, if you pay attention just to the math, it's going to be less scary. So uh, addressing the question of uh, Remy, yes, in reality is not equivalent to coherence. It has precisely the same shape, the entropy, Paul Neumann entropy of the measured state minus the entropy of the original one. Yes, it looks like coherence, but there is a, a, a small and very important difference here, which is this map is acting over just one part of the system, not both. So because of that, the irreality can be decomposed into the re irreality of only the partial state when you trace out Bob's part. And this, it is exactly relative entropy of coherence plus a non-optimized quantum discord. So this measure, it shows to you uh, more than just coherence. It shows to you coherence, local coherence of the state in that place, plus some correlation between the two parts. That means that if you have an entangled state, that will prevent your state to contain reality. When, when a state is entangled with another thing, properties in this state will cannot be real because this thing will be greater than zero. Okay. Uh, so what is the reality? Can we uh, quantify or organize it in a quantum resource theory? Yes, we can. Uh, and you can organize the, the entire uh, framework in a quantum research theory where the three states will be the reality states, I mean, the measured states, and the three operations will be the monitorings. The monitorings are maps that interpolate between the strong and uh, weak measurements. And by weak measurement here, I am using the definition of Voreshkov and Todd Brum from 2005. This map can interpolate between uh, doing nothing and making the projective measure. 
connect the GPU to bind the reality matter is a trace difference between two um, density matrices. But if we trade that matter to zero, that means it's linear or not. So you are asking if I define using trace distance. Yeah, in instead of uh, uh, the, even if this phi law is different from law, mm -hmm. the entropy may be the same because it's trace. It's a, it can be immediately transformation between the difference between two density matrices is mm -hmm. only unitary transformation. But it's a relative entropy. It's yes. related. It's related. Uh, yes, so it's this related. Double, double something. Those the double lines. It's a relative entropy, right? Yes, it's related. Yes. But after that, you can show that this expression can be decomposed like this. This is a uh, von Neumann entropy. Uh, minus trace of rho logarithm of, of rho. So my question is uh, that measure is just number, right? It is, it is it's just a number, yes. Number, so. But this right. will only have, will only be zero when this is equal to this. You cannot, it can, it can only be zero when these two guys here are equal. And that is a, is a theorem, is the Klein theorem, I cannot remember. Well, equal up to, I think what, what mm -hmm. Mekun means that equal up to a change of phases, which is irrelevant here. Yes, which is, yes. Which is irrelevant. Yes, you can have unitary rotation, Mekun, but it's irrelevant because it's like a change of phases. Okay. But what is important is the correlational structure, which is using rho, not the global basis. Mm -hmm. So two density matrix is just a change of basis. Uh, it uh, doesn't mean actually uh, uh, it is actually uh, not not real. It is also real, right? If we two density matrix is just different by basis, uh, they are real, right? But you have to apply no, the same, no, the no, same no, case. The notion of reality comes from the measurement. Yes. So, uh, real for, for a specific measurement. If you change the local basis, for instance, to the mutually unbiased one, you, you lose the property of being real for the, for the measurement. So the quantity is preserved, but the, no, but there's something wrong, no? But because you're well, talking about local basis. Yeah, exactly. But, but this is the, uh, irrelevant, uh, this is, uh, this does not fill the global basis rotation. Right? Yes. Rho is a bipartite state. Rho is a bipartite so state. These are entropies if I rotate the base globally, which makes physically little no, sense. No, so, the, so the phenomenon entropy doesn't change, but the first uh, the first quantity will change, right? Because if you rotate locally, locally, yes, but if you rotate globally, no. Right. So if you rotate locally, it's like globally. And it's like or not. Global or not. But now so if one can change, the other one can change too. Uh, no, but you can you can rotate the basis after the measurement, then it will not change. Because if you rotate it before no, the, measurement, the measurement, yeah. then of course it will change. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you rotate before the measurement, then it will change. Well, I don't know what was the question, but uh, <laughs> okay. we don't know the question, but the answer is there. So maybe we can proceed. Quantum mechanics is always like this. Okay, so uh let's go back. A little bit. Yes, now we have this this quantity. It can be thought as a quantum resource theory. Yes. Uh, it is almost related to coherence, but it's different from coherence. Can we use that in a task? That is an open question. But what we can do with this is to understand a little better uh, behaviors that we see as, uh, as strange. For instance, you can understand a little better uh, behaviors in a quantum controller delayed choice scenario where you have a superpos not a superposition, but a morphing behavior between particle and wave behavior. So uh, last year, this, this, this guys uh, decided to do an experiment to compare with a previous one that we already know, which is the quantum controller delayed choice scenario. We know the delayed choice experiment is a uh, Mach Zender interferometer, but the path is very, very, very long. 
And in this, this uh, experiment, what happens is that you can choose if you're going to put the second B splitter after the particle passed the first one. And surprisingly, if you put the, the, the second B splitter there, the, the guys will say, okay, this particle is behaving as a wave because you can see interference pattern in the detectors. But if you not put this second beam splitter there, if you not put, what happens is that you have a which path experiment. It will say to you if the particle goes up or down, okay? This always happens even though you are putting the, the beam splitter there after the first particle gets in. Now, there is a second version of it, which is, uh, if you put the second beam splitter attached to a quantum control system. So you can put the second beam splitter in superposition between there and not there. And if you do that, people say that you start to see a, a morphing behavior between wave and particle behavior for this photon that is entering the interferometer. It will behave kind like a wave, kind like a particle, because this second beam splitter is in superposition. Okay, in this uh, this uh, this paper, what the guys are saying is that wait, no, this is not happening. This is not happening because the particle is always, in this case, the photon. The photon is always behaving like a wave because it passes to this first beam splitter. And the collapse of the wave function will happen later. So they discover a way to associate wave and particle behavior for this photon associated to uh, spin observables. And they describe it in reality or reality, if you consider the complement of that, which is written here, to these uh, observables of measurement of uh, particle and wave behavior. What they did, they change the order of these beam splitters. And when you do that, you can see exactly the same uh, visibility in the detectors. You does not change the visibility. You don't change the visibility. Okay, when you do that, now you can say that the particle is in a superposition, not a superposition, but in a morphing behavior between wave and particle. Okay, uh, when I was doing my PhD, I look at, at this and I ask, it, is there any problem with all of that? Well, one of the problems that I saw in that time is that these quantities are an arbitrary mathematical choice. We just go there and say, okay, I will choose von Neumann entropy to distinguish between these two, these two matrices. Because, I don't know, I wake up in the morning and I decided to use von Neumann entropy. Uh, could we use another measure, another way of measure the difference between these two matrices? Like for instance, using norms or Henry entropy or Tissalis entropy. Could we or not? Well, uh, in order to decide which one we can use, we can use physically motivated axioms. Well, pardon, but there is also a uh, clear answer to that. Uh, from a classical statistics, right? Mm. It depends what kind of uh, hypothesis testing scenario you are considering. So this is a hypothesis testing. You mm. have a phi a row and you have row, and you are asking uh, with which state you are dealing. Yeah. So you have all those scenarios. For example, the symmetric hypothesis testing and the result of Hellstrom, which uh, single out the trace meter, the norm. Yeah. Then you have uh, this uh, type two error uh, minimization, and then you get the relative entropy. So it's it just an idea that you can you can somehow connect all those distinguishability tests. They are somehow connected to the well-known procedures of a classical statistical experience. Mm -hmm. And it depends what is your objective. If you want to distinguish. Uh, keeping one error uh, small and the other bound, or keeping both errors under control. Both, I mean, you assign uh, truths to the false hypothesis or you assign false to the truth hypothesis. These are these two, two types of errors. Depending on which one you use, 
you are getting uh, you are getting first classical schemes, which were then 20 years ago or even 40 years ago, 50 years ago, they were translated into the quantum uh, distinguishability models. Yeah, so this is just a comment. So the first one is, for example, the symmetric uh, hypothesis testing, the Hellstrom result, the, the trace oh, model. This is not a problem of distribution to states. No? It's not that you have like a machine generates two states you measure and then based on the outcome you try to distinguish. You just want to measure how far like rho is from a phi a on rho. Yes. So, yeah, 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 yeah. But wait, 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 wait. There are again. You want to you want to check if rho is the same as phi rho or how far it is. Yeah. How so far it is. So you have a, you have them you have with the distinguishability norms that come the distinguishability metrics. Fisher information, Bureff metric. Yeah, so yeah. what I'm trying to say is that you can also look at the uh, question which you are asking. So statistically, mm -hmm. what, what kind of what kind of uh, error minimization you would be interested in, and this this should figure out which um, uh, which measure uh, of a statistical distance to work. Mm -hmm. so just just a comment. Okay. Yes, I think I am going in the almost same direction because we are going to investigate which properties each one of these measures present to you. Additivity, okay. mixing, okay. and properties like that. Okay, we are going to uh, get an inspiration from research theories of entanglement and coherence. And the first uh, axiom that we have to address, the, the first idea to get uh, our, our measure of reality will be this one. Um, in the double slit experiment, we all know this. You send the electrons to the double slit, the particles enter in a superposition, and you cannot assign elements of physical reality to the trajectories. The trajectories are not real. Okay, and that's why you see interference pattern there. Of course, that if I use, for instance, uh, Bohmian mechanics and pilot wave theory, you can, of course, assign reality to the trajectories, and that is fine. Okay, but we are not believers of uh, Bohmian mechanics. I am. You are okay. <laughs> well, but 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 then we can, the part, we can even more, do more. It's not that you can simulate those trajectories or write them down on the paper, but mm -hmm. you can weakly measure them, but weakly in the sense of uh, of uh, Aharon. There, there were experiments with those trajectories where we can measure, and somehow the peculiarities of Bohmian mechanics is nothing more when you look at it closely as the peculiarities of a Schrodinger equation or the current of the Schrodinger equation. Just a comment. Yes. yes. Different ways of doing No, it's a different ways of doing quantum mechanics because you assume that there is quantum a quantum. There is a particle, but let's not go into Bonner because we don't have particles. <laughs> this conversation is very like, I was okay. Already, I was already in many fights. Functional yeah. integral, yes, sharing your equation. I'm not fighting. I <laughs> expect that there would be a fight. There would be a fighting because it's a matter, it's a matter of a statistical experience. You know, I've been into Bonner discussions many times, and at the end, there is most likely fight. a fight. <laughs> Plus, it's not the subject of the talk. Yes, this talk gives you a lot of fight. I, I, I understand it. Okay. Uh, in 35, Bohm proposes uh, another experiment. Let's put a lightweight slit uh, in front of this, the, the double slit. And with that, what we have, we have some informer of uh, the, the path that this particle is, is, is taking. Okay. If you go there and you put this, this lightweight slit, then it will kick to the one side of the other. Uh, and after that, what you have, we have real trajectories because now the interference part vanished. But what's a lightweight? A lightweight is a, it's a very light weight that, that, that will go to the one side or the other side, uh, giving the moment, the momentum of the, the part. It is light enough to, it can be light enough to do that. There are some uh, experiments where the guys actually do that. And, and they are very recent, by the way. Okay, 
when you put this lightweight there, what happens? Uh, you have flux of information from the system to the environment. And by environment, I mean everything that is around. In this case, the lightweight state. When you have this transfer of the information, what happens? You start to get reality. So we are going to, uh, to we can see actually that this, uh, this uh, relation between reality and information is a shared view between quantum Darwinism and quantum reality, for instance. You need uh, to get information about the system in order to get some degree of reality. But then you, actually you, you are moving this single slip, but fixed, fixed momentum or momentum is also on the, that light uh, weight floating. If you have a definite momentum of a slip, mm -hmm. that means you are like fixed position at each time. Somehow you, you are fixed position of a, uh, so you already destroy the uh, the interference. Uh, I mean, moving. What's the difference between moving the slit and uh, the fixed slit in the slit single? I you would have a fixed slit, then you would have a diffraction on the slit, and the the the, the very heavy will not turn because then you would have a coherent. Right. The fact that it moves, mm. the computer. Okay, I will move forward, and then we can go back to that. Okay, so uh, how we can uh, axiomatize that? Let's start with a uh, state, uh, a system which is bipartite. I want to define um, a functional that will take my state and give me a number. Okay, I am trying to discover uh, a measure of reality. But from this axiomatic point of view, so my system works like that. I uh, uh, the entire system actually. The system is bipartite, and I am going to entangle it with an environment. And I am define. I'm going to axiomatize that the amount of reality that we will gain from this uh, system it will be equal to the the amount of. Uh, conditional information from the environment giving the system. So if the environment, if it, the, the conditional information of the environment giving the system raises, I must have this, this quantity also raising. So this is my first axiom. Reality must change when we have a change in conditional information. Okay, but what is conditional information? Well, it's the complement of conditional entropy. Which condition of entropy? Well, that depends on the quantum information theory that you are using. Because if you start with von Neumann relative entropy, you can get an expression for informational content, which is just the complement of entropy because information and entropy are complements. And then with that, you can define a conditional entropy also with this, uh, this relative von Neumann entropy. And with that, you can define a conditional information. All of these elements of, of, of quantum information can be defined through these uh, divergences because relative entropy is one kind of divergence. Okay, so how do we do that? We take our uh, axiom one, which is the difference between reality, and we say that this is equal to the difference of uh, conditional information. After some equations, we find that this measure of physical reality is exactly the opposite of the, the irreality that was proposed at some years ago. So what happens? We start with uh, axiomatizing this reality and information flow with equivalence. And also we choose the von Neumann conditional relative entropy. And with these two conditions, we get back the reality measure. However, there is a zoo of divergences for you to choose. For instance, I can use really, uh, any divergence. I can use sandwich at any divergence. I can use Tisali's divergence, Tisali's related entity. Each one of them has different properties. And with these different ones, I can obtain different measures of reality. Of course, that I can also define unconditional entropies with those measures, with, this, with these expressions, all of them with your different properties. Some of them are optimized, some of them are not optimized, and therefore. 
Okay, I can also suppose other axioms. For instance, uh, that measurements must increase reality. Of course, that makes sense. Uh, uncorrelated parts must not decrease reality. Incompatible observables must not have maximum reality at the same time, which is something that I uh, have to agree with uh, Bohr's complementarity principle. Mixing must not decrease reality. Reality must be additive, must not change under flagging. You can choose a lot of axioms for you. Of course, is this list exhaustive? Well, we don't know. We don't know if this list is exhaustive. We don't know if uh, some of these axioms can be uh, obtained from the previous ones. This is an open question. But what I have here is like a menu where you can choose your, your, your way of measure reality. But each one of way you can measure, you have some conditions being satisfied and you know that cannot be satisfied. And with that, you can say, okay, this um, uh, measure of physical reality satisfies all of these conditions. This does not satisfy this one and etc. You have a menu where you can choose which one will satisfy your set of properties on it. Okay, so what we have so far, we have this realism hypothesis that was defined before. We saw that it can be, we can describe the reality as the difference between those two matrices. Okay. Uh, we also have the monitorings, which are this map that interpolates between weak and strong measurements. And these monitorings, what they do, they increase reality. Well, if you go there and start to observe your, your system, the degree of reality must increase. Okay, now the question is, how to perform monitoring? How you do that in the laboratory? Let's back, get back to this, uh, this figure here, where we have uh, um, our system interacting with the environment. And what I want is, I want to find uh, uh, a unitary that after we trace out the environment, what we get is the monitoring map. Okay, what is the shape of this unitary that will entangle this two system, the system with the environment such that after you trace out the environment, what you get is this monitoring map? Well, uh, it happens that Jurek, uh, together with Akhan Tuyu, find one of these matrices, but they don't know that, they just use it. That. It is the C maybe gate. It's just a C gate, a C not gate, but here you start to put some amount of noise. And with this matrix, they study uh, how much the quantum mutual information changed by adding more and more environments that interact with your system. And with that, they study the objectivity in quantum dampness. So you have more particles interacting with your system. And this interaction can be tuned to be strong or weak. And with that, you got more objectivity in your state. Okay, uh, so can we use that in our framework? Yes, this unitary matrix is exactly the matrix that gives us the monitoring map. You can choose that after you do this, uh, this interaction and you trace out the environment, the monitoring map that will appear has the intensity of one minus S and S is here. Yes. So, but wait, so the monitoring map was like associated to a measurement, no? Yes. So the measurement that this monitoring map is associated to is the, the combination of sigma X and sigma B. Is, is this one there? Or, yes, precisely. Or, or is this, you know, what is this? Uh, one qubit measurement. Yes, one qubit. Yes, this is for one qubit. Now, <clears throat> what we find is that if you add n qubits to the environment, you put your list of any qubits here, and you interact each uh, qubit of the environment with your system in a sequence way, what you get is uh, a sequence of monitorings. This can be shown. And this list of monitorings raised to the end, uh, 
n times these monitorings are exactly one monitoring with intensity one minus s to the n. This can be shown. Now, if you uh, add more and more environment, you, you take this n and go to the infinity, what happens is that this number gets to zero, right? Because s is a small number. And what happens? You got a projective measurement. So big environments result in projective measurements. It doesn't matter the intensity of this interaction between the, the, the particles. If we add more and more particles, at the end, what you get is uh, a projective measurement. OK. Well, this is a property of this monitoring map in general, because you have you have this definition, uh, uh, 1 minus epsilon rho plus, plus epsilon pi rho, right? Mm -hmm. So what happens if I, uh, if I take arbitrary this monitoring map and I apply it n times? We know what will be the result, no? Uh, apply the monitor the the measurements the phi a so several think, times to the same state m m epsilon i i uh, calculate m's power of m epsilon for arbitrary m epsilon uh -huh. i know what it is i know no yes well this because is the, the measurement it is here no no but but here this m is a particular one uh, uh, is a particular one with this measure. Ah, okay, but it doesn't matter what's the measurement, right? Yes. It doesn't, okay, okay, okay. It, it, it will always be like that, that this part uh, with the measurement will be dominating the the yeah, other part when the map does not, right? Yes. Okay, 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 got it, got it. Okay, now what I want to do is to extend this for qubits. And to extend this for qubits, uh, we need to use generalized observables, which are just Fourier transforms of POTMs. So we take the Heisenberg pale operators, the matrix X, the matrix Z. Well, this thing, like uh, Mihal Wodadetsky said, who knows, knows. And a possible solution to, to our problem is, well, let's take the immediate uh, generalization. Just put the, instead of sigma Z and sigma X, let's put just Z and X from the, the, the Heisenberg veil operators and see if it works. Well, it does not work because this linear combination here cannot be unitary for dimension three or, or greater than that. So you cannot just generalize it immediately. There is a solution. The solution is the noisy scene of gate for QDIPs. If you take a unitary operator such that, where these PJs are the projectors of your observer that, that you want to measure, Together with these unitary, generalized unitary observables here, T, they have this shape, coefficients times Z times X to the K. These coefficients here are, are no, we, we have a list of them. They are a function of a parameter theta. And if you apply the dynamics and trace out the environment, we obtain exactly the same thing. Yes. Sorry, so if, what you are saying is true. I mean, if you take uh, exactly. n power of any monitoring, I mean, if this n power with n going to infinity gives you the, the pi uh, mm -hmm. for any measurement, you don't have to look for specific polarization of that map, no? Maybe you can prove that this, this, this is true for, for any monitoring. And this is probably true because this pi is a uh, um, unread measurement. So, it should be reproducing itself. Pi, pi square is pi, right? Mm -hmm. So it will be reproducing itself while on the do nothing side, there will be accumulation of uh, numbers smaller than one, one minus epsilon to the n. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's uh, like an yeah, general maybe it's a combination of like pi and, and the identity map with different conditions. Huh? Yes, but phi is self-reproducing. So, yeah, when apply, so when you apply the map many times, phi stays the pi. there. But probably he wanted to see what is this. Uh, uh, from the coherence mechanism, he wants to see a monitoring map. Yeah. Yes. But I also have another question because I understand it different. Because I don't, I don't understand it as an application of the same map many times. It's just an application of one map to many particles. Yes. So if you measure, if you like take a measurement and if you measure one particle, you just like 
really irritated. You will just poke it and poke it and poke it. That's obviously that you will get something at the end that, uh, yeah, it will get re more real and real. But this is not what he meant, I think. He meant that you apply this this map, but to many different particles. Sure, more but after tracing the environment, you get like an, like an application. An application of the that was in the previous slide. Yeah, yeah but it wasn't like. Uh, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe uh, I can, can, can we please go, go back? Yes. Alexander, go yes. back like uh, two or three slides more. Yes, yeah, oh, here, 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 here. No. Uh, the second equality in the middle. This small n here, this mm -hmm. small n means that you have this map applied many times. Yes. Times, right? Yes. Okay, okay to finish. Uh, let's uh, take a look at this intensity of the monitoring, one minus eta to the end. So if this is the intensity, that means that eta to the end is the noise, the effective noise at the end. And this noise is given by this expression, and it depends on the, the dimension of the system. When you have only one particle interacting with only one particle in the environment, what you have is this. This is the intensity of the noise. And here we have the dimension. And here the, the coefficient, the parameter theta that will tune your measurement. Well, if you want to perform a projective measurement and obtain entire full uh, complete information about the system, you can only uh, do that for dimension three and four, because this is the case where you can reach noise equal to zero. To bigger dimensions, five, six, seven, you cannot reach noise equal to zero. So you have an intrinsic, in this model, you have an intrinsic noise for higher dimension. Now, of course, that this is the effective noise eta to the n. That means that if you take powers of it, all of this uh, curve will go down. And then if you have, for instance, n equal to four, what you get is a full projective measure. So here comes the, 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 the main result is that high dimensional systems require bigger environments if one wants to perform strong projective measurements. However, weak, no selective measurements can be performed with small environments, no matter the dimension. And that's finished my presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> More questions? <laughs> yes. So can you go back to, to the, yes, no, to the last slide, the, the conclusions? Ah, yeah. So here is, uh, you, you say that higher dimensional system require bigger environments, but like maybe it's the, uh, it's because, uh, because you have like more outcomes, like the, your measurement has more outcomes. Yes, it has more because outcomes. Had, like the same number of outcomes, like two. Sorry, say, say that again. So what if you preserve the number of outcomes with the dimension of the system? So like you always have two. Mm -hmm. That is a good Maybe question. Maybe there's no need to, I mean, the environment can be the same, like, the same dimension. Uh-huh. Yeah, that, that's a good question. What I'm saying is that maybe the fact that you need higher dimensional environments mm -hmm. doesn't come from the fact that your system is higher dimensional. It comes from the fact that the measurement has more outcomes. Well, in my model, everybody has the same dimension. So the system has dimension D, and each qubit in the environment, sorry, each qubit in the environment, all of them, each one has dimension D, local dimension. Yes, but the, but the dimension equals the number of outcomes. Mm -hmm. So now take the, the measurement of the two outcomes, which number does depend on the dimension of the system. And maybe you can, the environment can be smaller to get a projected measurement. No? Can you even witness uh, something like the system of higher dimension with just two dimensional outcomes? What I can like, I, like thinking about it in subtracting terms, because you are obviously can always like attach something to the environment that, that, that does something, right? And then you can trivially increase the size. So, yeah, but he's can, you, can you come back to the model? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. What is the the dimension of the first particle of the system. And PJ, what was PJ? Uh, PJ is uh, the, the projectors. The of, projector on the state, uh, it's like a controlled qubit, yeah? 
yes. Control QB. Okay. It's the observable that you want to measure. Can they be infinite? <laughs> I see them. <laughs> what problem? Well, what is infinite? <laughs> Is is there an infinite number of anything? In the field theory, uh, you can try to go to a limit, but you cannot do it for infinite, like continuous and work. Okay. I'm just seeing this. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yes, 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 yes. It, it depends whether you mean yes, infinite, like a, in a very, very large amount, but still countable, or like continuous. So I guess I'll have zero but plus one. Sorry, harmonic. A harmonic oscillator. And you see things harmonic oscillator, and then if it mentions integration of it, here everything is a discrete. But there is no way to discretize system and to work with all the systems. So it requires. More and more environments to, mm. to make the uh, system here. Yes. Okay. So, one, one more remark. Yes, I, please. I'm not a really specialist in this, but what I know from statistical field, all these attempts to apply other entropy than a Shannon entropy or Boltzmann entropy, they actually have no ground. The Salis entropy is, a, I believe, this is like a toy and nothing else. Because the reality, reality is that you deal always, you know, what in, in the um, dynamical theory, you have Bernoulli map. So Bernoulli map means if you have independent, in statistical theory, you count different states, right? They are independent state because it's different uh, uh, ensemble members which are which do not interact and then you have this mapping which is called Bernoulli map which is exactly gives the entropy of uh, Shannon everything else is uh, speculation you know look at this I don't understand or uh, everything or uh, better to say I understand almost nothing but when I see like different uh, entropies. Would I try to understand if there is connection in, in statistical physics, there is only one entropy. It has exactly ground, absolutely clear. Everything else is speculation, which is this time will just go up. So I want to uh, understand. It's more or less like that in quantum information also. They were attempts like, uh, Late 90s, I think. Kolodeskis were trying to use Rene entropies. Rene entropies. There was a little oh. bit of progress, but mm -hmm. really, what, what we have, we have, we use either uh, von Neumann entropy and relatives. Yes, von Neumann entropy and everything that you can define from von Neumann entropy. Or uh, or we use um, uh, for uh, this state discrimination we use a trace norm, which comes from uh, also from a very good statistical uh, ground from from the Hellstrom analysis, or we use fidelity, which may be least uh, least operational out of all of them. But when it comes to entropies, that's true that all those signs already. They do appear sometimes in the literature, but there is no big. Uh, yeah. my, my impression. But he was not using. He was not. He just. Yeah. Yeah. Not, I want to know something which I don't know. No, no, no. So you are, you are, you are right. Uh, as far as I know, the subject, the uh, the really useful entropy in quantum information is the uh, von Neumann entropy and the relatives. Quantum mutual information, conditional entropy. You, you see, here is uh, one word of. That you said is to me important. It's useful in in statistical physics. Uh, this entropy of Boltzmann is not useful. It's the only one. It's well, absolutely. It has strong ground, and everything is clear. Everything else is in mm -hmm. the ground, and you cannot find it. Yes, with this table, what I am saying, what I am showing is that hey, look, the other guys are bad. 
It don't give you the properties that we should expect from a, uh, a system. It's a it's a way of giving you more um, arguments to use the first one. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you very much.